The great thing about air training is it has to be interactive. That is to say, it's not like a lecture where essentially there's a one-way flow, we hope, of information. Here, I give you things, you've got to give me things back. What I'm going to do is dictate to you, and you're going to write things down in phonetic symbols. And I want to hear about whether you get it right or wrong. And whenever you get it wrong, then we'll practice that particular point. We're going to start then with a very simple exercise where I give you four English words. And I want you to write them down, one, two, three, four, in phonetic transcription and in ordinary spelling as well to show that you've identified what the word is. I'll give it them several times and then we'll go through them together. So here are our four words. Identify them. Match. Much. March. Madge. Again. Match. Much. March. Madge. Again. Match. Much. March. Madge. Again, match, much, march, match. We have match, much, march, match. Four different English words that you ought to have been able to identify each one correctly. So first we had match like a football match or to strike a match with a light. Then we had much, a lot. Then we had march, like soldiers march or the name of the month. And last we had match, which is a name. Who got them all four right? Good, well done those who did. Now, any problems with identifying A and the difference between A and B? Everybody clear? Match, much, much, match, match, much. Now, is this A or B? Much. B. B. Good. Match. A. a. Match. A. a. Much. B. Much. B. That's right. Any of the others you'd like practiced? Yes? A and B. A and D. That's match. Match. This, of course, is a matter of the so-called voicing of the final consonant. But you'll notice that in English, the J is not really voiced throughout. We don't say J. So you have to listen to something to do with duration. A is match, match, match. D is match, match, match. All right, A or D? Match, D, match, A, match. A. Match. D. Yes. Good. Any other pairs? That means we're ready to move on to another set. <laughs> Again, four words. There may be more than one way of spelling these in everyday spelling, but there's only one sound we're talking about. So here we go. Ride, light, lied, right. This is especially for the Japanese, of course. <laughs> Again. Ride, light, lied, right. Last time. Ride, light, lied, right. 
we have rhyme. Ride, be light, see lie, D right, for uh, three different possible ways of spelling D right. So this is an exercise on R and L at the beginning, and T and D at the end. First was ride, ride a bicycle. Then we had light, switch on the lights, light and heavy. Then lied, told a lie. And lastly, write. I don't write a letter, write. For most English people round their lips for R. Write. So number A, write. Number D, write. Sorry, rhyme, write. But we don't round our lips for initial L. So light and lied. So you want to look. Uh, the other point here is the T versus D, and you notice that this depends largely upon duration, because before D voiced we get a longer kind of effect, ride. Before T voiceless we get what we call clipping, but somewhat shorter, right than the D. <coughs> is there any particular pair you'd like me to practice with you? Yes? You're waving? Oh, it's very confusing, isn't it? Someone's <laughs> waving your hands. All right. <laughs> Words? Cola. Cola. Color. Cola. Again. Cola. Cola. Color. Color. Cola, cola, color, color, color. What color is it? Color round your neck. Cola, cola, color, color. Now, in the phonetic transcription, there I've put in the stress mark in the IPA way before the syllable in question. The final vowel each time is a schwa, a, a weak vowel, a. Now, any pairs there you'd like me to compare for? Yes? B and D. B is cola, cola, cola. C, uh, D is collar, collar, collar. O, 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 O. Traditionally called long O in cola, short O in collar. Yes? C and D. C and D. Color, 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 color. Color, color is C, color is D. Which is this C or D? Color. D, D. D yes. Color. <laughs> Again, you can look. You see I've got lip rounding for call, color, D, but not color, color. C, color. However, Americans, of course, would say color for D. Americans would say color, C, color, D. So you do have to listen to the sound. You can't rely on the lips. In American English, for reference, they are color, cola, color, color, like that. Ah! Now, mm -hmm. A and D, did you say? A and D. Cola, A, cola, cola, cola. Collar, 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 D. So, long and short, the vowel in A cor has close lip rounding in modern RP and so on. Cor, caller, it is the most rounded vowel we have, caller. The shorter vowel in D is not so close and not so rounded. Cor, collar, collar, collar. A, caller, caller, caller. D, collar, collar, collar. Which is this? Caller. A. Caller. A. Caller. A. Caller. A. Caller. D. Caller. Caller. That's it. Good. We have to build up now to having a dictation of connected 
speech connected English. Before we do that, just let's practice one or two uh, pairs of words that are related in meaning and in spelling that have very different pronunciation. So just take these two words, transcribe them into phonetic symbols as well as giving the spelling. The two words are study and student. Study, student. Study, student. Study, student. Study, student. Just to remind ourselves, really, of the importance of vowel sounds that are not shown distinct in the spelling. Because here we have study, and the vowel up, strut, we had a moment ago in color, what color it is, compared with the U sequence, semi-vowel Y plus U in student. Other things here, the happy vowel at the end of study, we discussed this morning, and syllabic nasal mm, in student, again, which we discussed this morning. Possible alternative pronunciation, student, with a schwa vowel between the D and the N, but we don't usually say student, we usually say student. Student. Did you all get those? Right, now some people, particularly in London, particularly people under about 30 years of age, say student. What are they doing? Student. Student. I'm a student. Mm -hmm. Student. What can we say about that? Well, you notice that the first sound is different. And so is the rest. So we get this kind of thing. Student. Student. Compared with my more conservative pronunciation, which was student. 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 English, like all languages, is changing. And we have to try and keep up to date with these things. It seems to me to be absolutely awful to say student, but I have to report to you that perhaps a majority of my undergraduate students call themselves students. <laughs> well, again, with phonetic symbols, we can write down the the differences and refer to them and talk about them and analyze them. Okay, we're ready now for some connected English. Try this phrase. I want it in phonetic transcription with rhythmic stresses shown. If you can do intonation as well, which some of you can, then do the intonation, but if you haven't done that, don't worry. So, so here we go. Who's that over there? 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 Whose means who is, of course. This is the contracted form we normally use in conversation. Who's that over there? Each word has a stress, so we have four rhythmic beats. Who's that over there? Nucleus is on the last of these, which is there. What was the nuclear tone? There. 
That's called a low fall. Who's that over there? So the technical name for the intonation pattern we have here is a stepping head and a low fall. This hasn't yet been covered in the lectures, but it will be in due course. Who's that over there? Stepping head, low fall. Typical pattern for a WH question, such as we have here. Now, all the vowels and consonants, are they straightforward? Any problems there? Anything you'd like me to compare and contrast? Good. I hope your silence means you're getting it all correct, <laughs> not that you're too shy. Answer? It's Bill. 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 That's very easy. Bill. Name. But we have to put proper names into dictations because proper names are difficult. You can't be helped by the context. Uh, there's not any support in the surrounding words in the way that there is with ordinary small words. So you do have to listen to the sounds. Did you all get Bill correct? Recognise the same. This is a nice, easy one to start with. That's right. The underline tells us where the nucleus is. Well, that's the, that's the tone mark. Uh, because I say I'm showing this with intonation. Now, if you've just got a simple stress mark, that's fine. That's not, not wrong. But what I'm doing is showing the intonation as well for those who have done intonation or who are interested in it. And in fact, we've got the same pattern of a falling tone again here. This one is a high fall rather than a low fall. It's Bill. Yes, so I think whistling is a very good way of demonstrating intonation. I'm going to paint it. It's Bill. Anybody got any questions about that? What's he like? 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 <laughs> Foreigner's pronunciation of that sentence. What is he like? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Characteristics of connected speech again. Then. <clears throat> What's he like? What's he like? What? Meaning what is? <laughs> e. Weak form of he. No h. Happy vowels. What's it? What is he? What's he like? What's he like? On the sort of like, and we had a high fall. What's he like? So a high head and a high fall. What's he like? In spoken English, this could also stand for what does he like? Although, I think I would probably make a difference and I'd say what does he like for what does he like and what's he like for what is he like? But 
fact, in some kinds of English, they would both sound the same, which is confusing and difficult. But there we are. This means, what is he like? So he's like this, or he's like that. He's similar to this, or similar to that. What's he like? All clear? Longer answer coming up. He's one of our best students. 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 Write it down the way I say it. He's one of our best students. He's one of our best students. He's one of our best students. Now, he's, again, this is this weak form, happy vowel, means he is, he's one of our, I didn't say our, because we don't normally say our, we say our, and meaning he's one of our best students. I'm worried about this big level. this picture is not that All right. Our best students. What did I do there? I left out the T of best. We call this elision. It's one of the things that happens in ordinary spoken English. When we have a word that ends in ST, like best, and the next word begins with a consonant, like student, we tend to leave out the T. So rather than saying best student, which is difficult, we say best student. With a long S, best student. Best students. He's one of our best students. Intonation stayed low till best high head students. High four. Any problems there? Yeah. Well, this is the way we usually pronounce this word. <laughs> what can I say more than that? <laughs> but you usually use a, a trifle. You, you write a trifle, oh, yes. yes. Well, listen out. Listen to people talking. See if you hear anybody saying our. You will hear one or two people saying our, but most of the time you'll hear people saying ah. Well, if you can't be as a native speaker of received pronunciation, which I think you can, this is what I normally say. Why? Why? <laughs> well, if you want some discussion about it, this is what we call smoothing, where a diphthong before a weak vowel loses its second element, and the resultant R coalesces into a long vowel. And in this word, this has been sort of lexicalized so that it isn't the product of a, an ongoing process, but it's just the way the word is pronounced. I mean, one of the first things we learn as little children is to say the Lord's Prayer. What are the first two words of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father. And that's certainly the way I learned it. Our Father. Our Father. Our Father. And um, so this is very deep set. I'm sorry if it comes as a surprise, but there we are. This is how we say it. Well, they do, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but that's why this is an exercise in listening, because 
all the good dictionaries do give you both of these possibilities. Yes, we, we face here a dilemma that we often do with teaching English as a foreign language. Should we use the pronunciation that corresponds to the spelling, because that's easier, again? Or should we use the pronunciation we usually use, even if it doesn't, again? And it's a dilemma. Here we're just practicing listening, so I can do whatever I like, whatever is more difficult for you. <laughs> ah, he's one of our best students. Good. What's he studying? 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 Study. Now there again we've got a contraction, what's, meaning what is. This time I pronounced the H. I could have said, what's he studying? But I said, what's he studying? Because this is an exercise for you to listen, whether I pronounce the H or not. What's he studying? Study, happy vowel at the end, before the ing suffix. Studying. What's he studying? Nucleus stud. High fall again for a WH question, so high head, high fall. What's he studying? What's he studying? Yes, any problems? Any queries? Any discussion, please? Would there be any difference if instead of the happy vowel and the, the E, which yeah. Yeah. Sound, we use a long E? Well, it would sound a bit funny. But what's he studying? What's he? If we stressed it, we do that. What's he studying? But what's he? What's he studying? I didn't use that sound. I didn't say what's he like counting. You know, two, three, four. I said what's he studying, and not what's he studying. Now, this is a very subtle difference, and obviously utterly unimportant. So let's not waste too much time about it. But in fact, this is a weak position, and I weakened the vowel in the customary. It doesn't sound different. Well, it does sound different, yes. Yeah, enough to know which is which. But it's not worth worrying about the difference. What's he studying? Muriel, one at a time, yes? Do uh, you use uh, capital I instead of happy I? Uh, well, if you insist, you can. But uh, we use the happy vowel symbol because we want to reflect the fact that it isn't quite the same as the short vowel I. Traditionally, that's what people do, so... We have to allow you to do it. Somebody here. Are we obliged to do it? Are we obliged to, to show it when we use the happy vowel? Well, same question. Um, we recommend you to. And I think the main reason, perhaps, is the fact that my kind of pronunciation that uses really much the same quality for the happy vowel as for the short vowel is becoming old fashioned. Um, you're getting all these young teachers of English as a foreign language who don't do that naturally, but use something like happy, and either we're going to have to say the dictionaries are wrong, or we're not catering for their pronunciation. This is a freedom. This happy vowel gives you greater possibilities. It says you can use the old ik, or you can use something tenser, and it doesn't matter. So I think you should see it as a bit of liberation, uh, rather than as some extra terrible problem. Uh, another question, uh, the vowel is clear. Uh, well, 
that's not relevant really to the topics we're discussing here. We can discuss it at length afterwards okay, if you wish. I'm going to let My understanding go. is that sounds are for phonemes, and phonemes are things in your head. Square brackets are for things that we can actually pronounce, noises. And uh, so basically I'm oriented towards square brackets when I'm giving dictation. However, because we do phonemicize this, for this kind of dictation, you can argue that it's more sensible to use sounds. I'm using neither one nor the other, so the issue doesn't arise. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, Where are you? When you add inflectional endings, uh, D, Z, ing, uh, we keep the it there. So we have carry. Like You're thinking about spelling. I'm not thinking about spelling, finishing in Y, none of these. But yes, words like study, studying, and playing. Happier. Playing, well, play doesn't have that at all. Play has play. When we add in, we add in. Play. Pray you have to get away from thinking of this in terms of orthography because. Orthography is not where it's at in terms of pronunciation. Studying, playing, trying, another one with a Y, of course it's trying. Yeah. Lots of people taking the IPA test fell down on the word trying because they forgot it has two syllables, try, in, and they thought it was some kind of prime, which it isn't. Okay, does that cover those worries? Get on. Okay, what's your study? The phonetics of modern languages. 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 Okay, weak vowels, schwa's in the first two syllables, the, ph the phonetics of weak form of all. Modern, pronounced with a syllabic nasal, the way I said it, modern. Lang is the nucleus, low form. Languages. The phonetics of modern languages. How was that? Very difficult. Very difficult. Well, we like to stretch you, but I hope it makes sense. The phonetics of modern languages. Anything you'd like me to compare or demonstrate? Modern, 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 modern. modern. Both possible. So they are no form. That sounds interesting. 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 Just 
interesting. Elided the D from sounds, pronounced just sounds. That sounds interesting. Various ways of saying that word. I gave you interesting, not interesting, and not interesting. Certainly not interesting. <laughs> that sounds interesting. We had a high fall on that, followed by a low rise on inch. Yeah, anything there? Without the L, it would be Jeff. Sure, Jeff. Mine was sure, Jeff. Can you hear the L? Jeff, Jeff. Well, it has to be there. I mean, in a word like health, you couldn't leave it out. You might vocalize it, but you couldn't omit it. Health, wealth, wealthy, Jeff. Sure, Jeff. Dark L, of course, in this position. Jeff. Anything else? Sure, Jeff. Another one? Sacrundor. 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 <laughs> Last time, Sacrundor. The stress vowel there was crumb, the same vowel that we had from strut and colour and so on. Crumb, crumb, it's a crumb. Are you just a crumb? Sorry, wait, maybe we were just talking. Okay, yes. With an L at the end. It's a crumb. So you've got that kind of thing. It's a crumb. Well, that would sound very similar, wouldn't it? One of the things we're going to see in the next lecture is that L can be vocalized in this position, which does make it sound similar. They are different, though. We still have a difference between Warsaw and Warsaw. Uh, <coughs> Warsaw, Warsaw. And this one ends in Saw, and this one ends in Saw. And can be very difficult to Saw. Door, that's a vowel. But that's a very understandable and reasonable confusion, so don't worry about that. Anything else? Yes, at the back. Yes, why did you use the, this, N, this NG and this crumb? The Vila nasal, why did I use it? Because that's what I said. Okay, you. I thought it was a simple N. Right, you thought it was an alveolar N, which would be that, which would be crundle, crundle. Well, this is especially to trap all the Spanish speakers and all the Japanese and so on, for whom this contrast is tricky. Both are possible in English. Mine was crundle, crundle. On the board is crundle, crundle, crundle. That one is called vila, 
This one is called alveola, which is this, crundor, alveola, crundor, alveola, crundor, vida. <coughs> well, this is the old problem of, uh, you know, you, you mustn't uh, sin here, you mustn't sing here. Uh, if we can get it before a D, uh, you mustn't sin, dear, you mustn't sing, dear. They can be in contrast in that position. Okay. Yes? Sorry. I already had my answer when you said sing dear. I was looking for an example in English. Okay. When I've given you one. Thank you. Jolly good. Yes, we always have to think whether this is actually important, and it's not terribly important, to be honest, but it's a good exercise in listening, you see, and so that's why we torment you with it. Well, I think we'd better stop at that point uh, because we need a little break before I need a little break before the next lecture. Uh, somewhere, yes, here, I've got a fair copy of the connected stuff. Who's that old accent? And that's why, in a sense, they're important for everybody. That's what Mr. Kofi Annan did. Uh, well, yes, with Kofi Annan, because he sounds so very erudite and eminent in other ways, maybe we, we can accept it. I think in general we can accept it from foreign learners in, in a way that we can't from native speakers, because we know that we don't apply the same social criteria there. I mean, this, they say this is why Irish people have been so successful on British television, because we can't place them socially. Anybody who's English, yeah, stop as well. That's right. Anybody who's English, we immediately slot them into a class slot, and we either think, "Gosh, how vulgar," we feel superior, or we think, "Oh dear, I am vulgar. How superior that person is." And so we're not on the same level. Whereas with the Irish or the Scots, as you say, we don't know how it works for them, and so we just take it as we come. Right. Where's my bag? Me for my. This is really nothing more than a weak form. Londoners have a strong form, my. But unlike the standard English weak form, the RP weak form, which doesn't exist of my, we don't weaken it really. We say, where's my bag? In London, you can weaken it to me. And where's my bag? Give to the weak form. But this is, again, looked down on and regarded as uneducated and so on. Well, yeah. What about the use of give me? Give me. What about the use of give me? Give me. Instead of give me to me. Uh, there are several issues here. Are you just talking about give me? Give me. Or are you talking about the grammar of no, give me. Where the it goes? Give me. The. Okay. Or the yes. 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 The question is whether the it goes here, give it me, or whether it goes in the end, give me it. And uh, we get confused about this. We don't know. We sort of avoid it because we don't want to get it wrong. Uh, the safe one, as you say, is give it to me. Yeah. Everybody is happy with the grammar of give it to me. Uh, we can certainly say give me the bag. The question is whether we can also put a pronoun in that area. I don't think we can say give it me in any kind of standard English. But you are quite right that this is something that varies a good deal in non standard English. I thought you might be asking about the pronunciation of give me, which is a reduction of give me, like let me for let me and so on, which on the whole is more widespread in America than in Britain, but we do know about it. Let's have a look at these cockney pronunciation features that we've got now. The first one is important because it's found everywhere in England, in working class speech. And this is H dropping. Take any word that has an H and just don't pronounce the H. So if you're knocking in nails, you use a hammer. You'd hit the nail with a hammer. In Cockney, you can hit the nail with an hammer. In the north of England, you could hit it with an hammer. So this is not just London, it's not geographically restricted. On the other hand, it is socially restricted. And once we get 
up into the middle ground, the estuary English area, then people pronounce the H's in the standard way because we are very, very, very sensitive to H dropping. It's a very well known social marker. Anybody who's on their best behavior linguistically makes a great effort to pronounce all the H's. Sometimes, of course, this goes too far. People who are insecure about their H's can make a big effort in the wrong places. And so, when it's Easter time and you have an Easter egg, they might call it a haster egg. <laughs> oh. I can remember when I was in primary school, there was a girl there and the teacher told her off because she spoke of a angel instead of an angel, you see, trying too hard to get the ages back. But the fact of the matter is that in popular London speech and popular speech in most parts of the country, people are not confident about ages. And so my gardener, for example, he knows about this. It's a great joke for him. He says, should I cut your grass right up to the edge? And it might be the hedge, or it might be the edge of the law. And we know that it we can't tell which it is. And this is therefore confusable. Well, in standard English, we do make the difference between edge and hedge, and everybody teaching English in schools to native speakers teaches the children to do this. Edge dropping, very widespread, but considerable. Londoners have special weakening. Uh, the word window, a good example here, pronounced as window where instead of an O at the end, you've got a schwa and a window. Do you remember in Dickens, there was a school called Do the Boys Hall, where the schoolmaster, Mr. Squeers, believes in practical education, and he teaches the boys to spell winda <laughs> by getting them to clean the windows. Dickens spells it like this, thereby telling us that the schoolmaster himself is ignorant and is using the non-standard pronunciation winda, along with the sensible spelling for that, instead of, of course, the standard pronunciation window, which suggests the standard spelling. So he's poking fun at the schoolmaster, the uneducated, unqualified schoolmaster in the bad school that he's describing. Londoners don't necessarily distinguish them between a pillow that you sleep on and a pillar, a common, both, uh, a column. Both of them can be pronounced pillar. You uh, and two. You has a weak form which is not very weak in RP. Namely, you. That's what we had in thank you. In London, it gets weakened further, it gets weakened to ya. This is not really standard. So, Londoners can say thank ya with a ya at the end. You will often hear people saying, see ya, <laughs> meaning goodbye, which in my English is see you, see you. And that difference again between see you and see ya is full of social meaning. See you is the upper form, see ya is the lower form. So it's a matter of how much you weaken this. When we have to at the end of a sentence, uh, I may not be able to do it, but at least I'll try to. At least I'll try to. I use to at the end there. Semi weak, still rounded and back. Cockney would be, oh, try that, try that, try that, try that, with this ah, that, and the end. That's not so. Okay, <clears throat> those are rather subtle. 4.3 is nice and easy. TH fronting and stopping. TH sounds. We know about the TH sounds, the dental fricatives. Difficult. Many foreign languages don't have these sounds. Well, Londoners don't like them either. And so instead of I think, people say I think. I think. So we get 
th becoming th dental becomes labia dental. We count one, two, three. <laughs> Not three, but three. Three. It does lead to confusion. I've got three tickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, there we are. We have to live with it somehow. You can tell from the context, people always say, well, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. The voice one goes to the. So instead of having a mother and a father, you've got a mother and a father. Mother, father. That's easier, isn't it? And uh, it's spreading very rapidly. In Britain and the press, you noticed it. Have you? No, it's not your imagination. You do hear it more and more. Um, people keep uh, sending breathless reports. You know, it's reached Durham. <laughs> uh, there was, uh, in fact, it got into the papers because people have started doing it in Glasgow, in Scotland. You see, and this was reported as. Uh, Cockney reaching Glasgow, you know, shock horror, and they invented a special name, Jockney, for it. <laughs> Jock being our word for a Scottish working man. <laughs> but of course, they don't sound Londoners at all like Londoners. They sound Scottish, as they always have done, but it's just this one particular feature that does seem to have spread so fast and so rapidly. So who knows, in a hundred years, perhaps nobody will need to learn to make dental fricatives, TH sounds, at all anymore. At the beginning of a word, something else can happen. If we take the phrase this and that, well in London you can get this and that, with the, the labor dental, but you can also get other things. You can have this and that, talking about this and that, with plosives. So just in initial position, not anywhere else, you can have duh, this and that. Now, we don't say mother for mother or father for father. Not in London English, you do in West Indian English and so on, which is one of the influences, but that's not become a London thing yet. You can also get nothing at all. It's now. Talk about it now. It's now. And particularly after another consonant, you get kind of assimilation. What's all they say? What's all they say? Now, all this then becomes all this then. All this then. It kind of assimilates to the preceding consonant. So these initial dentals are very weak and easily changed. Which means, it does have one important message for foreign learners, that although these are difficult sounds and you must learn to make them, in rapid speech you can sometimes forget about them and lose them, leave them out. And if you say all this, it will pass unnoticed. What's all this? What's all this? What's that? What's that? We can leave out the the in that kind of position. All right, back to London then. We have this fronting, moving to a further forward place in articulation, or stopping, turning into a stop for these dental primitives. Four point four, this is our next important London feature, L vocalization. Now we haven't yet got round to talking about L sounds in the lectures, but we have two kinds of L sound in English, clear and dark. Clear L, uh, used before a vowel. Dark L, all, uh, used elsewhere. Dark L, all, uh, has a kind of uh colouring. And what's happened in London is that the actual lateral articulation with the tongue, tip, is lost, leaving just the vowel colouring. So we end up with a kind of all uh, vowel, for which I should use that symbol. And it means that in a word such as milk, <coughs> you see pronunciation, traditional form, milk, dark L, milk, milk, what we get instead is milk, 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 
Well, we don't actually have any L sound as such at all. It's a kind of new diff. Milk, milk. Just try it saying it. Milk, 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 milk. Well, millions of people pronounce this word that way by now. It affects L wherever it's before a consonant or at the end. These are the, the positions where L is dark. It means that in a word like cell, we have a new diphthong, cell. Canal becomes canal. 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 In a word like middle, we get middle. Middle, which is much easier to say. Rather than little, we get little. Or because this interacts with long stops, we shall come to in a minute, we can get little. Little. And these are much easier, really, probably for most learners than the traditional middle and little. So I always feel that uh, you know, if somebody can easily say middle, that is better than saying middle or something with an inappropriate middle, uh, an inappropriate kind of attempt at an L. Uh, and it's, of course, becoming more and more acceptable as more and more people do it. L vocalization. Milk, shelf, middle. Tables. T glottaling. Ah, glottal stops. I keep wondering if I want a picture to entertain you with. I don't know if I have. Yes, I have this one. <coughs> In various parts of the word, ends of syllables particularly, T is undergoing a change so that instead of being made with the tongue tip on the alveolar ridge in the traditional way, it's made at the glottis. Up, 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 up. That's called a glottal stop. Up, 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 up. And this means instead of saying rabbit, you can say rabbit. Rabbit, 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 rabbit. Rabbit, rabbit. For Japanese learners, this should be easier. This is what you do after a short vowel at the end of an utterance in Japanese. So you say te or you say hai. That's a glottal stop at the end. This is the same thing as we're doing in rabbit. Glottal stop. But in other positions as well. So there's a butterfly. 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 And a printer. Uh, and a kettle. Yeah. Kettle with the vocalised air. Kettle. Kettle. A little kettle. Yeah. <coughs> On the handout, we've got the examples football. Football. <laughs> football. Ball. Well, traditionally football with a tongue tip T, but now increasingly football where the tongue doesn't bother to make that movement, but you still get the glottal closure making a voiceless sound. Football. You mustn't leave it out, you mustn't say football, but football is creeping into received pronunciation by now. Football. Get out. Now I say get out. In certain circumstances, I can say get out, particularly if there's a consonant following. Get out now. Get out now. I can do it with a glottal stop. Get out now. Or get out there. Get out there. Before a consonant, in my casual English, I can use this glottal. Londoners, and increasingly everybody, does it now between vowels. So, first of all, get out in isolation, but then also get out. Get out. Get out. However, there is another possibility, which is this. Get out. What am I doing there? Get out. Get out. Get out. I'm doing the American style voicing of the T. 
making it like a quick D or an R sound or just get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. That is another possibility. We can use that phonetic symbol for it, or we can just write it as a tapped R, get out. We've got a battle going on really in London and more generally in England between these two tendencies. One is the tendency towards glottal stops, get out. The other is the tendency towards T-voicing between vowels, get out. Do we say, put it down, voicing, or do we say, put it down, glottal stops? They're both